happy you're here, and we will enjoy what you have to share with us. Thank you I'll for having me. pass it over to you. All right. Thank you all so much for having me in your class today. So I'm Kristen Pratt. I come from Washington State University. Um, and was asked to teach a class today. We're going to talk about culture and kind of understanding our own culture and the culture and community as a lot of you are interested in thinking about education um, and how culture works between us and between the students that we teach. Um, so what we're going to start with first or kind of what are we going to be learning today or what are we going to be thinking about um, and the first one is I'm hoping by the end of today you're going to be able to distinguish between these two ideas of visible and invisible aspects of culture what does that mean how do we understand that and then how does that shape how we see our world um, and then the second part is to be able to unpack the invisible parts of culture um, and how do they influence the visible ones so the things we think we know about each other, the things we think we see and understand, how are they really influenced by the things we don't see and understand? Um, so to start us, we're going to start with a little activity called What's in a Name? Since I don't know you and you don't know me, right? Uh, we're going to learn, hopefully, a little bit about each other. I put this on here. It's a really interesting discussion, but class is pretty short today. So we aren't going to have time to watch this interesting discussion, but we can send these to you if you're like, oh, this was provocative and made me think. Um, welcome to watch that and click on that link to watch it, okay? So on your desks, I think most of you have, have this. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to work in small groups. So you can work with groups of two or three, whatever is convenient for you near where you're sitting. And you're going to read these excerpts. And these excerpts are talking about how people interact with their names and what does that mean, how do we engage with my name. And then at the bottom are a series of questions for you to kind of reflect and think about your own name the origin of your own name, if you know it, if you have, I don't are you have electronic Word. devices, you're welcome to use those to look up kind of your definition of your name if you don't know um, what that means. And then we'll come back together and kind of unpack what our names are, what they mean, and hopefully I can get to know at least a few of you before the period's over. Okay, we're going to take about six minutes to read, but well, ideally you take turns reading them out loud, but I don't know your comfort level with each other since it's only your second class. So if you're more comfortable reading them just quietly to yourselves and then talking about what you read, that's fine too, okay? Questions about how the task is gonna work? Voila, okay, let's take six minutes then. Thank you. My name is Hope.
once you're done reading, before you answer all the questions, process with your peers that are sitting next to you and your thoughts around that struggle or engagement with names and how the people that were writing that you were reading about understood that, okay? And then answer the questions. So if you are done reading, please feel free to visit with your partners next to you about what your thought. Michaela Dawn, um, and my first name doesn't really have a whole lot of significance. It means gift of God, but my mom didn't know that when she named me. My name was originally supposed to be Deanna, but her aunt's name is Diana, and her dad thought that I was getting named after her, the aunt, and so it was like a big wow. feud. So that's how I ended up with the well name Dawn because it's his name. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for sharing, Michaela. And say your name one more time. Uh, my name is Nicolette Geyer, and uh, the 
official reason that my last name is Geyer is that I'm descended from this German folklore guy named Florian Geyer who's involved in the peasant revolt that uh, happened during the Lutheran thing. But the actual story is more likely that my family, which on my dad's side is from Germany, kind of went into a, in the kind of post-World War I era, wanted to prove its German stock and getting good with the people who were getting in charge at the time. So, you know, a lot of people claim to be descended from people like Florian Geyer. Most people call me Emma. I didn't look at what Emma meant, but Emily means rival, and my middle name is Rebecca, and it's Hebrew for to bind. And my last name is Bowers, and it means shade. Interesting. It's just a bunch of dark things. <laughs> More powerful and wonderful things of creating new beginnings. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> we'll, t we'll say it that way. Mm -hmm. Thank well, you for sharing. <laughs> Anybody else? Um, so I was named after my mom's great grandma, so my great great grandma, because she passed away when my mom was pregnant with me. Um, and her name was uh, Katharina, because she's Italian. But my mom thought that would be too, she didn't want me to be made fun of. I don't know why she thought I'd be made fun of for that. So she named me Katie, which was my great great grandma's nickname. Okay. And all growing up, I was really like, I wanted to change my, legally change my name to her actual name, because I. Just like a thousand Katie's. Like my classroom are always had multiple Katie's. But yeah. But you haven't yet. No, because it costs. Yeah. <laughs> but Maybe later. Yeah. Maybe later. I am empathize, I'm Kristen. And then at the university where I work now, just in my one hall, there are three of us that have the same name of Kristen. But I was telling this group up here in Urban Dictionary, my name means most awesome girl ever. So just so you know, today your guest lecture is the most awesome girl ever. Okay. Um, part of what we were thinking about when we're thinking about our own names and how we understand our names and engage with our names and they connect us to culture, thank you for that, Nicolay, that sharing of that, um, was that names really do identify us with culture and they're one component of how we understand our own culture and how we understand our connections to the broader scope of humanity and our place in it. So the culture, the definition for culture, if you can just take a quick second to read that. Okay, so as we think about what is our own culture, everyone has one. Um, the way that culture gets talked about and defined, I think, in current society makes it sometimes challenging for everyone to be able to connect to that and identify in with what their culture is or to feel proud of their culture, depending on the context where you grow up. Um, but we want to unpack that a little bit today. So we are going to do um, a little bit of thinking around the features of culture. So in your groups, this time you really have to talk, okay, not option. Um, with three people, so please don't leave anybody out talking about one example that you can come up with for a style of dress in your own culture or in U.S. culture in general, since we're all in a U.S. context, everybody has reference to this context. I mean, if you have reference to other contexts, please talk about that in your group for each one of these things. And then we're going to have a representative from your group you can choose in your group of three who you're talking to that's going to share out when I call on your group about one of these things. So if you need to take notes, take notes so that you can remember when it's your turn to talk to us, okay? We, I imagine, probably like 10, 12 minutes to talk about all of these things, but if we need more time, we'll take more time in 10 minutes or so, we'll check in, okay? Do you need me to pair you in groups of three? Are you comfortable managing that yourself? All right, peeps, I'll pair you in groups of three, okay? So you're gonna be a group of three. One, two, three, please. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Okay, one, two, three. One, two, three. And then can you be group of four? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay, so let's take, oh, sorry, one, two, three, and then one, two, three. Okay? All right, so 10 minutes, please, to discuss each one. Take notes if you need to of an example of culture. <laughs> Uh, 
So if you look around the classroom, you don't think twice about seeing uh, whatever you identify as wearing a hoodie with the strings and, you know, like pullover hoodie or um, like band sneakers. They, I mean, they're literally unisex styles. They have like a men and women section at the store, but mm -hmm. they're the exact same thing, just with a different size written on them. Or what else do we talk Like baseball hats or beanies or um, jeans, too. It's just mm -hmm. kind of, there's no real status quo with the dress and whoever you are, you wear whatever and nobody has a second thought. Of course, there are certain styles that might have that second thought, mm -hmm. but in general, more so than other places, I think that we have a lot of things that both like, or that any gender wears. Yeah. 
Yeah, thank you for that. Varies depending on yeah. the region. And it's definitely. I don't even think region. about age too, but like you can see like a baby wearing a pullover hoodie and like an elderly man wearing a pullover hoodie. So <laughs> it's just kind of all the same. Thank you. Thank you for that. A great explanation. Does anyone have something different to add to that or contribute? Alrighty. The second group, how about ways of greeting people? What could we come up with? Um, that for the most part is pretty casual, like, hey, what's up, or like, how are you, and then, especially the how are you, like, we don't necessarily want, how are you, we don't really want to know, it's just like a <laughs> formality, and we want you to say good, pretty much, for the most part, like, when you, when you greet people, like, that you don't know well, maybe it's different for close friends or family, obviously, but, yeah. We don't mean, how are you, we just mean, hi say fine, and that's the end of the exchange. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We were talking about that it's also dependent on context, right? Because you probably wouldn't say hey to me because you just met me and that might be inappropriate, right? It wouldn't be quite formal enough. And you wouldn't shake the hand of your friend because that would be weird, right? Mm -hmm. And so it also is the register of how we communicate with those I think of if you've had experience to travel, some places it's really normal and expected that you're gonna touch cheeks and you're gonna kiss even with people you don't know, or you're gonna touch foreheads with people. That's how you say hello. So here we say hello verbally, or we might give a handshake or maybe a hug, but it's more like a distant hug, right? Not like a hug, unless they're your friends. You all were gonna say something. Go ahead. Were you gonna say something? No. Did I miss it? You're just like this, just hanging out with me. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. I was just gonna say along with like the hug thing, I come from a big Irish family and so it doesn't matter if you necessarily know the person, my mom and my grandma are going to hug you and they're going to squeeze you really hard like you don't <laughs> want to be touched, but they're just going to do it because that's the way that they were raised and mm -hmm. like if you leave without giving them all hugs then it's like a normal sin that you yeah. yeah. It's very culturally embedded, right? It's a feature of culture and how you identify and connect. I feel like a handshake is like a, more of a formal thing, but like definitely like how like the handshake if it's not like a firm handshake, like you know when it's yeah. a bad handshake when you yeah. meet someone and it's super awkward after. And then you leave thinking, oh, this was terrible. Yes. I want to do over. Yes, how do you avoid it? If you don't quite reach your hand in far enough and firm enough. I mean, you just gotta go with it. <laughs> <laughs> what do I have always? Uh-huh. Or do you shake it into like a friendly handshake after that? How do like a bro? Like I don't know. That's right. That's right. Anyway, thank you for sharing that. Okay, beliefs about hospitality. What'd you all say? Um, so we said beliefs about hospitality, like usually when you go over to somebody's house, you like hang out with them or like you eat food and play games and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, like, talk and stuff. Yeah, thanks. And it's important for saying like please and thank you and in my generation, it's really important that you um, take something and that whatever you take, you leave at the host's house, right? You don't like take all the food with you when you go. My in-laws live in Thailand, and it's an opposite encounter for them. When people come, the expectation is the host sends everything home with their guests. That's your responsibility as a host. So all of the food that's there, all of the stuff that is there, everyone packs up and takes home. So very different than how we engage with hospitality here. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, so I, there's like two different sides of the spectrum of like in my family at my aunt's house you can go over there and you never know who's gonna be at the house because people will just walk in to get food and you're just like i have no clue who you are <laughs> but we never go over there but then there's people like my house where i generally kind of like if you want something take it there's nothing really here that we don't we're not okay with you eating right and then apparently not everybody's like that because i once forgot to fed my, feed my friend for like a day because i forgot to eat and so she ended up getting really dizzy and had to go home. Because I forgot to feed her because I'm like, you can just go get food. Like, what? Right. But in her world, you needed to offer it to her to be able to have it. Mm -hmm. It's a great example. Thank you for that. It's one of the ways that culture is invisible, right? In the ways that you are trained or indoctrinated into the idea of morality about what is right and what is wrong. It's hidden until you spend a lot of time with people or they chastise you for something inappropriate that you did but you didn't know. Mm -hmm. We talked about how it's kind of custom 
in the United States to say sorry what? when you're not even sorry. Or like when you just shouldn't be or don't have to be. Like in my class I just got out of, um, the person next to me dropped her phone on my foot and I said sorry. <laughs> yes. like, oh, you're fine. Yes. It just happens. I guess it's a formality. It's, it's almost true. it's almost the same as saying you know like she said oh you're good. It's almost the same same as me saying oh you're okay for dropping that on my foot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Other things. Okay. Then the next importance of time. How about you? Um, we talked about how. Um, in the U.S., people are working really on time. Like even in high school, if we're like invited to be on time because we get in trouble. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we were talking about even on time isn't you're late. Really, when class started, like at two o'clock, we were standing here talking. So class starts at two. So you have to be here by five, tell, ten, tell. Mm -hmm. And then we'll share. With you. We talked about how in the U.S. in particular how um, there's kind of like two polar opposite sides of like the importance of time because one side of it is like you only live once, go out and do what you want to do, like this is your life, like spend it how you want to, and then the other part of it is like how we grow up with our parents, like you know you need to go to school, you need to get a good education and have this great job so that you can have this great life then afterwards, so there's like two polar opposite views of time. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. I feel like everything like in the U.S. needs to be fast, like Everyone's like looking for the fastest route to get across town, the fastest way to get food, the fastest way to get through school, the fastest way to anything. So there's yeah. It's not that way on the world, right? Mm -hmm. It's more um, end destination versus process. Yeah. For sure. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, we had a, an exchange student from Namibia living with us for a while, and we would tell him dinner's going to be at 5, and we would all be sitting there at 5, and he'd show up at like 5.45 be like, why are you guys waiting for me? Like, it's dinner time, and it was just his African time, like, he just showed up late to everything, so we had to start telling him to, like, come at an earlier time, so mm -hmm. not in time. It's the invisible culture, right? Until you've been trained, how do you know? But then we have acts of politeness or rudeness, perceived politeness or rudeness, right? That it's rude that you didn't come. Are you going to share something in that vein? Uh, yeah. Just with the vein of time, mm -hmm. like having worked nights for a few years, it's incredible the amount of disdain you can get from people for sleeping, you know, around noon, despite the fact that you have to be at work at nine, you don't get home until six, right. and you know if you're up at seven in the morning making pasta, people think that's 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 weird. Why aren't you making toast or eggs? Or yeah. Whatever. Yeah. yeah. There's definitely boundaries around like normality. Mm -hmm. Dissonance between schedules. Definitely, yeah. Like our day sleepers especially, I think we experience that a lot. Um, forms of fine art, what do you all say about that? All right. Uh, we uh, briefly discussed, at least from the Pacific Northwest, that uh, probably the biggest cultural fine art that shows up is a lot of the street art you can see come out of Portland, mm -hmm. where uh, just people spend lots of time and effort making these huge displays of color and literally culture, pop, a lot of pop culture, mm -hmm. a lot of just culture for the times that's just there for anybody to look at. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, for the next one, for values, what did you all say? Uh, well, uh, one thing we talked about was how America has this enormous value compared to a lot of other countries on benefit, benefiting yourself and on independence. Uh, the idea that, you know, if you can't get something on your own, you may not deserve to have it. Uh, we're very we're very big on that kind of ideology of the whole, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps uh, concept. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, like people just want the best of the best. They like kind of like post. I feel like a lot of people want to show that they have all this through like their social media or like have like the picture perfect, whatever they have. Mm -hmm. I think that's a huge value people see today. Uh -huh. Something they place a lot of value on, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, for sure. Thank you. So I feel like not only do values differ from family to family, but from generation. Like 
our val this generation millennial is going to have very different values than our grandparents or even our parents really because they change with the experiences that we've gone through and the um, world that we live in. I mean, in this class, we're being fairly critical already talking about too much focus on money, but there's a really strong nationalist thing in America. Uh, not as strong as, like, you know, some countries like France, but definitely like this idea that we should love our country, and that we should love our troops, and that we should love our police. And a lot of, you know, uh, a lot of group, a lot of, like, uh, structures that other countries, if they, you know, saw, saw that they might be a little bit disturbed by it because we are a little bit unusual, not that unusual, in how much we can have to love We're going to, for the sake of time, not get to all of these, okay? But we'll do, each group can share one more, and then we'll move on to the next way we're understanding. But ideas about modesty, what did you say about that? Um, we kind of talked about how, like, in our country, modesty isn't as big of a concern as it used to be. Like, I just think about, like, going home and, like, showing my parents stuff that I bought, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I would never worn that one. That's your age. And stuff like that. And, like, just thinking, my aunt lives in, um, Bangladesh, and she has to wear like certain things so that she doesn't like offend people, and she can't show her ankles and stuff. And there's all these rules about it because of like religious reasons and other like cultural things. Mm -hmm. And it's just like interesting that in America we can kind of wear whatever we want to express ourselves, so we don't have to like we don't have that much focus on being honest all the time. Something like that. In certain spaces, right? Yeah. At work or at school, mm -hmm. those are um, parameter a little bit for me by authority figures. But yes, in social spaces, I think there's a little more liberty for how we understand what that means, for sure. You both work in the Um So my best friend, her family's from Pakistan, and so she's Urdu, and I went to mosque with her one time, and so she had she gave me this entire outfit I had to wear, and I had to have a scarf, and then we went to Florida for a school event in high school, and she did not have a pair of shorts or bathing suit, so we had to sneak to the store and buy her bathing suit, and when she got to Florida, she took her jeans and she cut the legs off because she didn't have a pair of shorts. She's not walking around in jeans and a like long shirt in Florida. She's like, oh. Interesting. Thank you for sharing. So we talked about how the idea of modesty is really changing a lot based on how we perceive people's bodies nowadays versus how we perceive them uh, in earlier times uh, because the idea here, at least, of a body being like purely sexual isn't as big as it used to be. So a lot of people here show more skin and um, don't worry about that because it's kind of becoming more of a natural, normal thing um, to not think of a body purely for sexual reasons, but because it's natural. Thank you for sharing. That shift. Will you all be offended if your group's not petitioning? Okay, well then that's a perfect pause, perfect pause. So when we're thinking about this list of things though, what I want you to think about for the next thing we're going to talk about with culture is what things are easy to see or notice or critique and what things are not so easy to see that become what we would say are invisible. So quick scan this list and make an idea in your mind or you have your list written on your paper. And for the sake of this experience, everybody has a culture. So we're thinking about, you're not gonna actually do this because we only have a few minutes of class left and I have one more thing I want you to think about. But when you're thinking about your own culture, these are the ways you can kind of talk about your own culture and thinking about the languages that you speak, the fine art that you enjoy, the types of food, the manners, what your extended family, their role in your life or their not role in your life. You express that really well about independence. Um, and not collaborating in groups. It's definitely a cultural value. Um, and then how we understand these ideas of what respect looks like, honesty, timeliness, etc. 
So as you're talking about your own cultures, these are ways that you can be thinking about your culture and how you're cultured. Okay, so a researcher, I think it's in 76, Edward Hall, I think, came up with this idea of the cultural iceberg. And this is just metaphoric to be talking about the things we can see, like the way I dress, or the way I color or don't color my hair, or the food that I eat. Those are all things that are visible or things we can see. But what's invisible is how I understand morality, how I understand religion, etc. So in your groups, what I want you to do is from the list that we had on the previous slide, which I'll pull back up, categorize them in two groups, okay? What is visible culture and what is invisible culture? Questions about that? So you just make a T chart and put what's visible and what's invisible. Okay. Thank you. 
talked about things like MySpace Top 8 or like your Snapchat best friends list. I mean, they did away with that, which was probably wise, but you can still even look at your own Snapchat list and see who has hearts next to it, who has emoji with sunglasses on it. Like, you can kind of almost value that. Or like, I didn't even think of this, but like red receipts. You can see, you can kind of judge how good of a friend somebody is if you say that you need them and you see like rad at 2 14 p.m and you're like, <laughs> oh, okay like i mean it's kind of easier yeah. to unfortunately like draw conclusions from with little things like that and then we also after you walked away we talked about um like i have no qualms with like linking arms with my best friend while we're walking around at the store and like laughing out loud and just being ourselves and not really caring people are seeing that mm -hmm. or you talked about like your friend like you know excited to see you like jumping on you like friendship is pretty uh obvious you okay tell people are friends and then this idea of the nature of friendship being invisible as things that go ahead and give a quick explanation um when you meet someone you don't really know their values when it comes to friendship mm -hmm. you don't really know they are a true friend or not until they stab you in the back or until they are a lifelong friend yeah so the habits they have with their friends are invisible to you until they can strike exactly thank you for sharing appreciate that mm -hmm. so i think it can go either way because there's you know because of social media 
there's lots of people who have really close friends who they've either never met or only have met a couple times. Mm -hmm. um, I became really good friends with a friend in Southern Oregon, and I moved shortly after we became friends, but we talk every day still, and we visit each other once a year, but nobody, like, my family's never met her, even though we've been friends for years, because we don't live close. Yeah. And, you know, I was good friends with this um, lady, uh, hadn't met her, but she, I moved up here, and she happened to live here, and now we hang out, but before that, nobody would have known that we were friends, because we don't, like, nobody would see us together, yeah. it's just conversing online. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, in the nature of time, I guess, I'm sorry. I'm going to just talk really briefly about how culture impacts our behavior and ideology. We don't have a lot of time to unpack this today, but as you're thinking about all of these things that are invisible, that you can't see, how they impact how we act and what we say is right and wrong and what we judge other people as being as right and wrong or rude or polite. Um, so when we're considering our interactions with others, being thoughtful that there might be invisible, invisible culture that you can see playing in this backdrop of what's happening in that particular interaction. So our final thing to consider, if you're interested in reading about culture, young adults, um, books for those of you that are interested in education, I just put a list of really interesting texts that are great to read to help you understand culture differently from different lenses and perspectives. Um, so when you get to see this one, there are some from the continent of Africa, Afghanistan, Mexico, Cuba, um, Eastern Asia, There's lots of opportunity, okay. So in closing, if you could please on a half sheet of paper, just complete this exit slip with your name and today's date. This is just for me to kind of judge what your takeaways were. Um, if you have questions for me about this, please ask. And I can respond back to your professor and get you the questions back. And then may I just have your attention right quick so I can explain what you need to do. Thank you so much. The next one is for your celebration, or what did you take away from today's lesson that you didn't come in here with? If you don't have anything, don't feel like you have to put something in there. Um, but I would love to put you in something. And then application, how do you plan what you take away from today to apply to your life? Okay? Take just about three minutes to do that. And thank you so much for having me as your guest today.